how is and, and you've been maybe in an abusive relationship in the past where you were a doormat. You were walked on, you had no control, no authority. The person that you were in a relationship with walked over your boundaries, took advantage of all that. And you've had time to heal and now you're getting back out there. Yeah. How can that person create a great dating experience in that first date to put themselves more in the driver's seat with some authority and not a doormat mentality? All right, so there's two things. I think the first thing is don't take out on that person what was done to you by somebody else. <laughs> That's the worst. They're just, you know, because we've all been victims of, of things to some degree, right? And let's say even if it was, it, it was abusive, it yeah. was horrible, it was that. It is also not fair to take that out on an innocent person, mm -hmm. like to take your trauma out to someone else. And sometimes we can feel trauma elsewhere and then project it onto someone else who didn't cause that to us. So I would say that's the most important, because, more, most important thing because it will allow you to connect. The other thing I will say is the majority of people tend to trust. When we have relationships with people, we tend to go and trust people. So when someone says something to you, you tend to believe it. We believe it. The average why person. Why is that? We're just engineered that way. And I don't even know why that is, but we tend to, to, to sway towards tr trusting the person. In law enforcement, actually, it's the opposite. Law enforcement officials are notorious for thinking people are deceitful. So the average person believes people are honest. Law enforcement believes people are deceitful mm. because they deal with more people who lie. But that causes a problem elsewhere because when you do have innocent people. Who are telling the truth. They're telling you the truth. And then you get false confessions. Mm. You get problems. You're looking at the wrong person because you're confirmation bias. That's a whole other animal over there. But knowing that we tend to give people, um, we tend to believe people automatically, just hold a little bit of that back. Don't believe less. Just be more reserved in how much you mm -hmm. trust. Discerning about it. Yeah. Yes. Just don't put it all out on the table. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, this guy's great or gal's great. I just connected with them. And then what we do, we go nose in. And so you don't want to give unconditional trust. Mm. So unconditional trust is like, I give you now trust across the board. I trust you in everything. When you start dating someone or any new relationship, even in business, always conditional trust. Mm. I'm not gonna trust you all the way, I'm gonna trust you part of the way. So now here's the thing, we love to trust unconditionally, which is probably why we tend to just wanna give people trust. It's less work. I could just turn my brain off, I can trust you, Louis. Great story, yeah. Louis, ask me anything you want, because you <laughs> asked me in the beginning, is there anything off the table? I'm like, no, Louis, go ahead and ask. <laughs> but you give that person unconditional trust, and I don't have to think so hard. I don't have to worry if you're gonna manipulate me. I don't have to be on my guard. It's easy. It's easier, that relationship. Mm -hmm. Conditional trust means I have to be a bit more careful. So it's like me going to buy a car. I know I'm dealing with a car salesman. I know I should be careful. It's just understood that they try to get you to buy certain things and use certain language. So when I go in, I go in with conditional trust. And so I'm better protected. Mm-hmm. And that's why there you're less likely to get hurt in those situations where you understand, I can't fully give everything to this person. I can't fully trust them conditionally. I can, um, so I, excuse me, unconditionally. So I have to just be careful. The thing is, that's work. It's a lot of work. We get tired. We access a specific part of the brain when we do that, a more complex part of the brain. So that's why unconditional trust you don't want to give it right away. And that is why when we get betrayed by people close to us, mm. that's why it hurts more. The most, yeah. It's usually by people who betrayed us, un, uh, who we give unconditional trust Ooh, to. Yeah, that so That's my advice for dating. That's when it stings. Would you use the same approach if, let's say you're, you know, I haven't been on a first date in forever, but let's say you're on a date, your first date with someone. Would you say, hey, why don't you have some water? Why don't you use the restroom first? Where would you like to sit? Would you do the same approach no, there? I, I would not because I don't want to establish authority there. Mm. That's not, if you're looking to have a relationship, I would not do that. That's not, that's that's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a controlling unhealthy What should you establish, trust? I think rapport and trust. Uh -huh. And I think probably the best thing you can do is just not talk about yourself mm. and listen to Ask that other questions. person. 
Just what, ask about them. What would be the, the, the... You did that to me when I walked in. Yeah. What it was like, heavy, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I was like, oh. What would be the three questions, three most fascinating questions someone could ask on a first date that would not be interrogational, but be uh, connecting questions? Ted, tell me, tell me about yourself. Explain to me what your dreams are. Describe mm-hmm. to me what your, you know, what your hopes are. Don't, don't create a question because you may ask a, a question that you think is fascinating and they're going to look at you like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> like you don't, right? Because we, we, you don't know what they think like, what, they, what their, what their so aspirations are, what they're... We're on a hypothetical first date. What would you say to me? A- using the Tell tech. me about your podcast. I'd love to hear all about it. Ooh, okay. Explain to me how you got into that. Describe to me like what it's like when you interview all these different people. Mm. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let you go, Louis. Because now I get to hear you, I get to see what you, you're like, your values, your beliefs, what excites you, what doesn't excite you. Excite you. You're going to tell me about why you started it. You're going to tell me about your background, what got you into it, any uh, growing pains or heartaches or how this happened. You're going to tell me about your favorite guests, your not favorite mm-hmm. guests. You're going to tell me about the amazing things you learned or maybe some of the things that you were like, I can't believe I brought this guest on. And so now you just opened up this world and I had to do no work and I can just listen. These are more indirect questions, is that right? Or open-ended? Open-ended questions. So don't ask a direct question. Who is your favorite guest? Don't say no. that. I would tell me about, tell me about your guests. Mm. And then I would allow you to naturally tell me on your own because you feel like you're in control and there, it's more likely that you will tell me on your mm. own. But if I ask you directly, and if you want to protect the integrity of the people you interview, because you don't want to say, this is my favorite guest to right. make it public, because then it, that's, it's going to hurt the people that come on the show, right? Yeah. Your clientele, so to speak, your guests. Mm-hmm. So I would, you're not going to answer it. You're going to be reluctant. Oh, Evie, I love everybody. Everyone, it's like my kids, you know? It, you can't say yes. you have a favorite kid. It's all your kids. You're going to say that. Yeah. It's like when people ask me, who's your favorite president? I always say, I love them all. They're all, they, I, I love protecting all of them. Mm. But if, Somebody says, tell me about the people you protected or tell me about the presidents you protected. Now, I feel comfortable. I'm in control. I'm talking. The more we talk, the more we leak. I'm less guarded. It's less direct. I don't even know you're trying to find that. And I may naturally on my own get there. Tell me about a characteristic of a president that wowed you the most. Hmm. You You, You like that opener? You like that over there? Oh, you use, my, you use Ted on me. <laughs> a characteristic from one of the presidents that you were just like, obviously they were all inspiring in some way, I'm assuming, for you, but tell me about a characteristic or a, a belief, a mindset, an approach, a strategy that one of them used that wowed you. I liked, there's a couple, there's like little things. I'll tell you, President, former President George Bush, senior, he used to write note cards to everybody. He had a little, he wrote note cards. Thank you so much. He would just send little note cards to people. And I saw what an impact that made to people to re- receive a handwritten note. He hand wrote it from someone saying, thank you, or I appreciate you. And to this day, I do that. Mm. I, and I, and I, took that, I took that from George, uh, President George Bush because I saw that and I was like, what a wonderful thing and I saw mm. how much of an impact that did. It was a very little thing, but I, I took that from him. So whenever I meet someone or there's an exchange or something, I will write a handwritten note card. Thank you for your time. I appreciate mm. it. And it, it does a lot. Did he write you a card? He did not write me a card. He but wasn't you're... my full-time protectee, <laughs> but I watched. Yeah, you watched him actually write it for other people? Yeah. Or you I mean, saw you other people get it? Both. And... You would see them when they would work and you mm. would know what they did or didn't do. But that's what he did. Hmm. And another characteristics, I think, I liked President Obama. I liked the way he spoke. And for me, that was very, I appreciated that because I, although I was an agent and an interviewer, I didn't know how to speak for myself. It's weird, right? I could speak on behalf of the government and the law and all that. Um, but I never paid attention to the way I spoke to people and what I loved, you could hear him, you could hear him. Usually you call renegade, I could say it, it's public, it's on, it's in his book, renegade on the move, right? You could, you could hear the agent say that, but you could hear him. You could hear him. You could, I love the way he echoed his voice and projected his voice 
and didn't hold it back mm. and how he took his time to speak where a lot of people speak very fast because we feel that we're not worthy of somebody's time i don't want to take up too much of your time so i'm going to speak fast we do that we feel like oh, let me just hurry up and say this this person's probably busy they have things to do and then he really projected his voice mm. like it boomed through the hallways and that was a person who was not shy of being present of taking taking us a, a space and letting you know I'm here and mm. my voice is relevant. I like that. Mm, that's powerful. Yes. Any other characteristics from anyone else? Hmm. There's so many. The ones that wowed you that stood out. They all out? did. Like they were all great. George Washington, uh, George Washington. Oh my god. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> um GW President George Bush. He like I love going to the ranch with him. I'm from New York City. I go to Texas. And I was just like, what the, you know, it was like we were out in the wild. He's like, we're going, we're going to make trails. I was like, why are we going to make trails? There's a road right there. You know, we'd cut trails and hike. And he was very authentic. Who he was on camera was who he was off camera and vice versa. Mm -hmm. He was very just real. And so you'd see these qualities with different people and you know, it's kind of interesting. I just thought of it. I was almost like in my own school of greatness mm -hmm. by being in the White House. And then over all the years of about, you're around all these people, these influential leaders, despite, forget politics, it still takes a person of some- To, to get there. To, yes, to get there. And so you watch them and they're not just them. They've got cabinet members, other individuals who you know, you watch and you listen to, you see how they problem solve. Mm. And I was in my own school of greatness where I just got to, got to be front row and you're doing your job. At the same time, you're like, you're listening, you're watching, you're absorbing. I loved it. Were there any strategies you witnessed or watched or observed from them telling you or not telling you on how they commanded respect and authority in just their way of being, tonality, was it a touching people, you know, in their mm. hand? Is it, you know, whatever it is, Look, eye contact? What were the things that they did or that some of them did that really stood out to you? So I'll tell you this. They didn't have to work as hard. Because they're already the authority. Because they're already the authority. So you don't, so I want to say that. Like mm. they don't, the president can look at you and be like, hey, how you doing? Mm. And then like blow you off. And you're like, oh my God, I got like a whole solid <laughs> second. Whereas when they're talking to me or you, it's just like, he only gave me a second, yeah. right? So they don't have to work as hard. So even the little attention they give you lands on you. However, though, eye contact is huge. Mm -hmm. When you talk to someone and you want to convey, I, you want to convey, hey, trust me. And rapport, this is huge. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go to the supermarket and you look at cereal boxes, they have cartoon the characters on the cereal boxes. They're looking at you. You know where they, a lot of them look down. They're looking down. You know who they're looking down? You'll see cereal boxes where the character looks down. At the cereal? No. I'm, I'm a cereal box, right? Uh -huh. I'm the Trix rabbit yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah. right? Now, you go shopping. I'm not looking at you. I'm looking down. Why am I looking down? The Who's, rabbit's looking down. Right. The at rabbit's the looking down. Thank you. Wow. Because the kid's the consumer. Yeah. Not the adult. No. Looking the kid's going to hey, say, hey, Mom. Look, come grab me. Mom, buy that for me. Oh, my god. So they designed them to actually look down. And they also put them at a certain level. And so maybe in adult cereal, they'll have the person looking at higher up because they're looking at the adult. Eye contact is huge. It conveys, trust me, talk to me. I'm here, I'm connected with you. Even when you wanna listen to people, normally we do break eye contact, but good communicators will lock in. They're not uncomfortable. They're there, I'm with you, I'm connected with you. That is huge. But you touched on literally touching people. And you would see a tactic. I don't want to say a tactic, but a, a, no, it's a tactic. <laughs> it's a strategy. It's a strategy. It's, you know, hey, you know, Lewis, and you know, and maybe I like to touch your forearm. Yeah. You can do that. But I will say today. You can't do that. Today is very different. Yeah. You know, they would teach us that. They're like, hey, you can touch the top of a person's knee and just be like, hey, and I could be like, whoa, unwanted touch. So mm. now I would actually go against that. Mm. I would actually encourage people not to do that just simply because 
you don't know how it's going to be received. And now today, it's you got to be a little bit less is more with that. Yeah, I mean, shaking your hand maybe, and that's it for I a, think a, a so. second hand on the top, like a genuine heartfelt for two seconds and then let it go. You yeah, know? I think so. I think so. You want to respect people's space. Yeah. It's a little bit different. I think we have more, well, we do have more social space now. Yes. And it's interesting how that's going to change the dynamics of how we interact in the future. Interesting. How do you build that trust without being present and more connected and touching and... Right, and you have a mask. You can't even see the lower portion of a person's face, which conceals their expressions, their gestures. So it's even harder to read them. So how do we read people like that? Is it more body language then of like it's, shoulders yeah. down? As it's opposed harder. To In person is always better. And obviously, if you're on Zoom, you can see the person. Mm -hmm. But the tone, the inflection of the voice, does it change? Does it not? The body posture. Again, sometimes it's just as simple as how they say something you know, the way they deliver a story. For example, when I worked cases, sometimes I did, I did interviews and interrogations and I would be asked to help local police departments sometimes. And they'd say, look, we have this case and it, we've got three suspects, but we can't figure out who it is. Oh. And I would, you know, I'd, I'd always want to interview the person I thought it was. And so I would say, send me, do you have statements? And they say, yes. And I'd say, send me the statements that they wrote. Written statements. Written statements. About what they said they, their story is. Their story is, yeah. correct. Because these are people typically that had been already interviewed by local police. Mm -hmm. They got nothing. They have no proof. So they would reach out and they say, look, you guys are polygraph examiners. You're, you have a bit more expertise in this. Will you help us out? It's an important case. And so I'd say, send me their statements. And so I'd look at their statements and based on their statements, I would be able sometimes, most of the time, to tell who um, likely did it. And it was those statements that, and this also happens when we tell a story, when we speak. When you ask somebody, what did you do yesterday? When they deliver, you, deliver a beautiful story to you that has a beginning, Every two a middle, minutes, yeah. and an end, it's an arc. Mm -hmm. When it's a story, it's an arc, it's typically manufactured. That's a lie, usually. Yes, because... We don't typically talk about our stuff like that. And so when I would read a story, I would read a statement. And if I read like a story, because the person's like the liar is like, oh, I got to write a story. I got to tell them what I did here. Then did here. They're, they're manufacturing it. A truthful person is going to write how their day went. And a truthful person also makes spontaneous corrections. So it contradicts what a lot of people think in that if I correct myself as I'm telling you something, then it looks like I'm hiding something. Then I'm, um, I, um, it looks like I'm, yes, I'm correcting myself yeah. because I'm hiding something. I can't remember my lie. And it's actually mm. not true. Those when are the I, honest ones. Yes. Oh, it's actually, a, that was a mistake. I, it's a spontaneous yeah. correction. When it's unsolicited and somebody you're speaking to, or even in writing, you'll see a scribble. It's okay. If it's a spontaneous correction, oh. meaning they're correcting themselves as they're speaking to you, it indicates truthfulness mm, that's an interesting little yes and also too like a little one when somebody uses quotes when they talk to you they'll say oh he said and quote you know they'll tell you something somebody said in quotes like he said you know this in quotes that's also truthful the air quotes the air quotes when someone uses that not on the written paper quotes but the oh air even in both yes if someone uses quotes yes and i repeat this said this that means they're telling yeah. more likely the truth yes truth why is that because they're, they're, um, they're being very specific. Uh, we also know based on the research, people who lie, lie vaguely. Remember I said, it's work, it's hard work, it's you're trying oh. to create a lie, tell a lie, remember the lie, listen to the person speaking to you, think about what you wanna say, there's so much going on. And so what they do is they, they lie vaguely because it's too hard for me to remember all these details, create all these details, it's just too much. It's a heavy cognitive load. I heard one time in one of these books or somewhere that when you say, I did not, as opposed to, I didn't do it. When you're like more specific of like, I did not do this, is that generally speaking more untruthful? Yeah. So I'm again, it depends the on the person. I'm thinking of a famous president that said, I did not commit these sexual relations. Well, he, he, we know he was dishonest. But okay, so you said that statement, I did not. And so it is true, most people like when, I'll, 
did you have pizza this morning for breakfast? No. You're not going to be like, Evie, I did not have <laughs> pizza this morning for breakfast, right? Uh -huh. You're not going to work so hard. Because it is the first time ever that we have a grand experiment of the humankind where we mm. want sex with one person in the long haul that is fun and connected and intimate and playful and we live twice as long. Mm. Go figure. Right, exactly.